can I make your hair stand on end? With great difficulty, Gareth. No, you, you must mean static electricity or something like that. No, there's no power involved in this how whatsoever. No power? Well, how do you do it? Well, to explain this how, how has come to the fun fair. Oh, I love a fun fair. Fred, come yes. with me and let's have some fun at the fair. OK. Fred, take your glasses off and come and sit down next to I me. I don't like the look of this, Gareth. Fred. Just trust me. Trust you? Never. Hold tight. <laughs> when I said we needed no power for this, I was telling the truth. You see, this roller coaster car needs no power to run. When it's cranked up to optimum height, it has a lot of potential energy. When it's released at the top, this potential energy is converted into kinetic energy. You get potential energy from being high and kinetic energy from going fast. And all the time we're travelling, we're exchanging one for the other. When we're low down, we go fast. When we're high up, we go slowly. There you go, Fred. That's how I make your hair stand on end. I don't know why they call it a fun fair. And you think that was frightening? How can you walk up walls? Well, humans would find it almost an impossible task. But David Manning has joined us here today with two creatures who can walk up walls. They're Gary and Freddy. Now, what exactly is Gary, David? Well, Gary is a gecko. It's a, a type of lizard, some of which have evolved the ability to climb walls or even very sheer surfaces. Now, how does he actually stick to the wall? Is, is he gripping? Well, each toe is a mixture of an adhesive pad and something a bit like Velcro, lots of tiny hooks that can grip onto almost anything. Let's meet Freddy. Now, Freddy uses a similar system for gripping. What is he first? Freddy's a, a giant tree frog from Australia. Hello, little fellow. They, they live in the tropical rainforest. Now, let's, let's see if he can stick to this plate of glass here. Can we put and him again, on there? He's got very large adhesive pads on each foot. Will he climb up? Can he climb? Yes. There you go. Yeah, adhesive pads, but they're like suckers, are they? They are, very much. So why have they evolved this ability to stick to walls? Well, largely to climb trees and either to avoid predators or to search for prey. They can reach the parts other tree frogs can't. <laughs> David, thank you very much thank indeed. You. There you go. That's how some creatures manage to climb up walls. It may be very easy for tree frogs and gecko lizards to walk up a wall, but if a human wants to walk up a wall, you're going to need climbing shoes, a safety harness, a safety helmet, and a pair of industrial suckers. These are my tree frog feet. Wish me luck. I'm going to try and climb this wall. That's one way in which you can walk up a wall. Hey. Oh. Yes, quite good, Toppy. Not as good as my namesake, though. Freddy's a tree frog. Fred, can I come down now, please? We're going to make our own highly mobile Excellent. mobile. Yes. And lesson number one is mm -hmm. you've always got to remember that you build from the bottom upwards. Yes. Now, where do you reckon my point now, of I balance is? Now, I think that's in the middle because these two weights are the same. That's, so that's in the middle. Yeah. Onwards. That goes there. And upwards. Yes. OK. And then I'll find the point. Now, this, you, you find the point because this weight times that distance is, must be the same as that distance times that weight. Correct. Oh, well done. Point of balance there, yes, we think. Yes, that's fantastic. And upwards. Fantastic, marvellous, super. There. Yes. Already, there. we're getting oh, a more yes. mobile. Very mobile. Mobile. Yes. How about a more massive? Bigger. And better. Bigger. Shall we? Yes. Come on, then. OK, you ready, yeah. Gareth? Yeah. yeah. Whoa! <laughs> Where's yeah, the more spin, Red? I think. More spin. A little it's quite more mobile, spin isn't it? Well, that's what I call a mobile mobile. It's yeah. fairly irregular, isn't it?
Come on! Come on! And as come they come approach on. the first, it's Gareth on Windy behind, just a short head in front of Fred on hair today and gone tomorrow, but it's anybody's race, it's anybody's race. Fred, I don't think we're actually going anywhere. Oh. We're just going round and round like a record. How many grooves are there on a record? Ah, a trick, Hal. One groove on each side going from the outside round and round and round and round to the middle. One, one groove playing one shoe. Absolutely. Yes. OK, yes. let's stop this. Now I'll put the needle on again at the start. It'll and it'll be the play. Same tune? Same tune. Of yep. course it will. Mm -hmm. on the bend, Fred. On the Different tune. Different tune. Mm -hmm. How come? Because. On this record, there are two grooves. One groove starting here, marked A, and one starting there, marked B. But how have they managed to do that? Well, then? if you think about it, on a record, on a disc, the groove starts on the outside and spirals its way into the centre. Yeah. But there is no reason at all why you shouldn't have another groove starting at another point on the outside of the record, which again spirals its way into the centre. Oh, and in fact, you can have, if you want, six different grooves, each with a different horse race commentary on, each with a different conclusion. Should we have a Yes! Bit? All right, yes, yes, those yes. are the six runners. Uh, can Pick I your have favourite. Uh, Callboy, please? You can have oh, Callboy. Choose Brown Jack as my horse. Okay, yes. Callboy Brown Jack. Yes. Are you ready? Yes. yes. On goes the needle and. They're off. They're out of sight at the moment. Yes, here they come. Come on, come on, come on Brown Jack. Come on. In a bunch. Neck and neck. One's come going on. ahead towards the post. Centurion. Come on, Jack. Centurion wins. Oh, Centurion wins. Fred, and you the bookie wins. You no, go again, Fred. No, it's absolutely genuine. There's no way of knowing which particular groove I'm going into, and therefore no way of knowing which particular race with which particular conclusion. Let's okay. bet again. Centurion. Centurion. Brown Jack again. Definitely. Centurion and Brown Jack. Yep. On goes the needle, yep. and they're off. They're out of sight at the Come moment. On, I can Centurion. hear the crowd cheering. They'll tell him to do any moment now. Yes, here they come, round the bend into the straight. Up come the on. rails, neck and neck Centurion. towards the post. One's gone ahead. Wins the lad. Wins the lad. Wins the lad wins. Oh. And as usual, the bookie also wins. But it was genuine. I had no idea which track it was going to be but how many grooves are there on a record well usually one on either side but not as we've seen necessarily and gareth fielder takes fred schumacher on the outside do you know what these cars run on electric not petrol think of all the pollution they're saving fred are you suggesting that we should drive dodging cars around yeah if we did that the pollution statistics might go down but the crash statistics would go up make everything a lot cleaner though maybe they should have done that in athens how did they almost come a cropper in the acropolis the beautiful city of Athens in Greece, full of wondrous things like the Acropolis and the beautiful Parthenon. But Athens had a problem with pollution, much of it caused by the motor car, because of course Greeks love to drive motor cars. And the problem here was particularly serious because Athens in midsummer becomes extremely hot and the city is surrounded by seven hills which tend to keep the pollution in. In fact, it got so bad that a poisonous cloud of smog, known as Nephos locally, spread over the city. It was awful. They had to get rid of this poisonous cloud of smog. What to do? Well, one bright spark suggested sending up a thousand helicopters over the city so that the downdraft from the helicopter blades would blow away all the smog. But, of course, helicopters themselves produce pollution. So I don't really think that's on. Still, someone else had the idea of getting rid of the nephos by sticking windmills on each of the seven hills in the hope the windmill blades themselves would blow away the smog. But again, I don't think it's really on. Someone else said, why not stick in order to get rid of the nephos? Huge tunnels through each of the seven hills there and there, so that the smog would blow away through the tunnels. But no, it was never really on. Finally, they got to the crux of the problem, the motor car itself. And they passed a law saying that anyone with a number plate with an even number could drive on an even number date in the month. And anyone with an odd number on the end of their number plate could drive only on odd numbered dates. 
That way, they thought they'd cut the number of cars on the road in half and cut pollution in half. Did it work? Well, no, you see, because the Greeks, being clever fellows, if they had an odd number on the end of their plate, they went out and bought a car with an even number on the end of their plate, which meant they could drive seven days a week. So the pollution was worsened and made even worse because the second car people tended to buy was an old banger, which made even more pollution. So the problem was worsened. So what was the answer? It really was so obvious. It had been all along, and that was get rid of all the cars altogether. And that's exactly what they did. Now in Athens, there are no cars, very little nephos, and the whole place is a pedestrian paradise. And that's how, in the end, they didn't come a cropper on the Acropolis. Whoa! Hey! Hey, I'm sorry, Fred, but it's a good job Carol isn't here. She always had difficulty steering. Yeah, right there, mate. Now, how can you tame your trolley? Supermarket trolley. Exactly, they Fred. Are a nightmare. It's very difficult, isn't it, when yeah. you're going around the supermarket to try to control your trolley. See, particularly if you're in a hurry. Oh, around <coughs> we go. It doesn't steer in a Oh, doesn't steer in happening. a straight line. Nightmare. You push it into people. No control. You can cause a lot of mishaps. And sometimes, in fact, it can be very dangerous indeed. Well, engineers have now come up with what they think is a simple solution. This is called the supermarket trolley tamer. Clips in here, very simple device, spring-loaded, so if it's any trolley, clips on at the bottom. And now, with this fifth wheel, you can gently just turn around that point, or you can push it in a straight line, making shopping much more graceful and elegant for everyone. How can I turn this glass upside down without spilling any of the water that's inside. Gareth, that's one of the oldest halves in the business. Piece of card on the top, tip it upside down. No, 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 no pressure. Fred, no, keep... no, no. I can turn this upside down with water in it without spilling a drop with no card. Yeah. All I have to do is keep the glass hanging down like this. Of course. Yeah. But all I then have to do is to change the direction of down from that to that. Gareth, even you can't do that because down is down, and up is up. That's what you think. Just watch this. This is my artificial gravity machine. Take it away, boys. A centrifuge like this is exactly the way that spacecraft of the future can create artificial gravity. The effect of spinning creates a feeling of weight away from the center of the wheel. So for me at the moment, down is in this direction. However, because we're still on Earth and down is supposed to be in that direction, then you get a combination of the two, which means that down right now is sort of somewhere that way. Now it works all right like this on the level, but what happens when you take it upwards? Watch this. Fortunately, the centrifugal effect is enough to keep me in my seat and the water in the glass, even though I'm completely upside down. However, because we're still on Earth, when I'm upside down, I get the centrifugal effect minus Earth's gravity, but when I'm at the bottom of the turn, I get centrifugal effect plus Earth's gravity. So as long as I'm rotating, I'm gaining weight and losing weight. Now, from Fred's point of view, right now, I'm upside down. But from my point of view, when I'm upside down, this is down. And that's how you can turn a glass of water upside down without spilling it. Gary, I believe you. Now will you stop that? Get dizzy. Another proof that what goes up usually comes down. How do you make a diva dive? A diva is a lead singer in opera. Leading isn't it? female yeah, opera yeah. singer. Diving well underwater or something sort like that. Of, more how a soprano made waves. 
Now, opera singers, as we know, tend to be larger than life characters in more ways than one. They've also got rather large temperaments. It's all that big singing. <laughs> but there was one particular opera production which will go down in the history books. In 1960, in New York, there was a production of Puccini's Tosca with a young American singer playing the female lead. <laughs> Now, she was a big girl, big in voice and big in temperament. In fact, she was absolutely beastly to all the stage crew, forever shouting at them and going on at them, and they hated her. They decided to get their revenge. Now, in Tosca, the leading lady's lover has been shot because they die a lot in opera, and the leading lady decides to end the whole thing and chuck herself from the battlements of the castle. It's a moment of high drama, and there's rarely a dry eye in the house. When the leading lady threw herself from the battle, she was supposed to land on a mattress cunningly hidden behind the set by the stage crew. However, on this particular night, the stage crew decided to swap the mattress for a trampoline. It was a night that she and they would never forget. down stuff. It's giving me an appetite. Tell you what, Fred, you know what you need? Well, a good square meal. What a good idea. How funny is an egg? Ah, uh, you're just going to tell us a load of uh, egg yolks, aren't oh, you? Yeah. Egg yolks. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's generally got egg on his face. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing funny about most foods. I shall prove that to you by uh, making a good square meal. So the first thing you need for a good square meal is a good square plate. On top of that, uh, the basis for a good square meal is a nice square bit of bread and uh, might want a, a bit of cheese on there. And of course, these days you can get conveniently shaped, sandwich shaped square cheese. Very nice. And a bit of sausage. Hold on, that's not sausage. Yeah, that's sausage, all right. Sausage doesn't have to be sausage shaped. In fact, in Scotland, most sausages are in fact square. There's one thing missing from this meal, and I need um, an egg. That's ah, what it is, yeah. But you can't have a square egg. <laughs> no. Of course not. No. You can't have a square egg. No. The end of that. that would be ridiculous, <laughs> yeah, wouldn't it? Totally. Come on, Henrietta, dear. Come on. Oh, dear me. It's a lot of trouble getting that one out. How about that? Nah. Now, that is a funny egg. That's not a real egg. It's not a real egg. No, no way. I shall prove to you that this is a real egg. Watch this. Where's my knife gone? Come here. Look at that. Oh! <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> well, mercifully, that egg wasn't laid in that shape. That would have been very painful. No, it actually started off life as a freshly boiled, still warm and peeled egg. What you need is one of these things. It's called an egg cuber. You stick your egg into the egg cuber, stick the lid on like this, and because the egg is still warm and slightly soft, it's fairly pliable. And after a few short seconds, with any luck, it will have retained its shape. Oh, Let's just see. Keep that's your fingers fantastic. crossed. And that's how you turn your eggs into, well, look, it's almost cubic. Look, it's cubic on three sides, anyway. It's one of the best house you've ever done. It's the best thing you've ever got right. <laughs> <laughs> so, how funny is an egg? Well, very funny. If it's not egg shaped, I'll tell you what, it's a cracking item. Oh! oh. <laughs> I've only got one thing to say about that. What's that? That was excellent. Oh, and you're not yoking, are you? I'm not. I'm egg static. <laughs> that's how how he went to the fun fair, and that's how for now. Do you know, I could just go a nice toppy apple now. <laughs>